Um, thank you for coming and thank you for those who are watching uh, from uh, the warmth of their rooms. Uh, my name is Chirag Karia KC. I'm making this introduction because Aleka is unable to be here and as the only LSLC council member here. It's my job to introduce um, Mr. Justice Bright, who will in turn be introducing me. So apologies for that circularity. Um, Mr. Justice Bright, uh, in, in his previous incarnation, Robert Bright KC, um, as you all know, um, is a, was a commercial barrister who practiced uh, at the bar. He read law at Oxford and was called to the bar by Gray's Inn in 1987. He sits as, used to act as an arbitrator, but now is a full-time judge of the commercial court, who is also authorized to sit in the admin court and other King's Bench work. So I'm gonna hand this over to the judge and he will conduct proceedings henceforth. Right, I have no idea what to do with this. So I'm just gonna put it down and let yes. someone else control it if they want to. Yeah. Um, it's a great delight for me to be back at an LSLC event. Um, I was thinking as I was strolling here today that I must have spent many, many hours sitting in congregations like this. I'm always coming away learning something useful, um, quite a lot useful in fact, and occasionally walking away, possibly having shared a little bit of knowledge that other people might find useful. So certainly I, I've been to many events as an attendee and occasionally as a speaker. And I think it's one of the most worthwhile forums that there is in our industry. Um, since I got appointed to the bench, which was um, not that long ago, uh, of course, I've done much less shipping work than I, I was used to before, um, which is in many ways a regret and in some ways exciting. But it's therefore a, a, a pleasure, actually, to be coming back and thinking again uh, about the thoughts that this topic provokes, um, which are a source of work to all practitioners, certainly from the time that I started and probably long before that, and I'm also certain that that will never end. I know one of the topics that's going to be covered, whether in at length or briefly, will be the possibility of bills of lading be, being substituted by um, digital means. Um, that may cure some of the ills that we our present system suffers from, but I guarantee you it will not end fraud or malpractice or shenanigans among shipping people who are incredibly expert at contriving new ways to deprive other people of their property <laughs> or money. And that will always provide lots and lots of um, work and revenue for all of you. So don't be frightened. Now, the panel going to be guiding you from the, through the maze today will, will consist firstly of, of, of Helena Biggs, who sits to my right, your left. Um, uh, Helena, as you will all know, works at Guard um, and has been working in the PI sector for a long time. Uh, I didn't know until I, I was provided with her CV that. After she studied law, uh, she then spent a year working in the bun bunker industry, I think in the Gulf, is that right? Uh, in uh, with a Greek. With well, a Greek with, a, with a Greek supplier, that's right. Well, if anything doesn't put you off litigation uh, <laughs> and um, the possibility of shady practices, then working in the bunker industry will be a pretty tough learning experience. So anyone who can survive that and still have some kind of yearning to work in our area of law um, is made of pretty tough stuff. Um, since then, as I say, Helen has been working for a, a long time in the P&I business. Um, I've, um, until today, I'm afraid, only known her by reputation, so it's a great pleasure to meet her finally. Uh, and her, her role, as I understand it, is going to be to give you a sort of general introduction to the topic uh, and talk you through some of the uh, common uh, areas of interest. Uh, then she's going to hand over to Mr. Cario Casey, um, as I've only ever previously addressed him when in court against him. <laughs> um, um, uh, Shirak is, is one of the uh, eminent ship, most eminent shipping practitioners <laughs> in this most eminent of um, shipping sets. Um, uh, I, I promise both uh, him and Mr. Rainey Casey, about whom I make the same qualification, that um, I would embarrass them by praising them to the skies. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to actually not make them suffer too much because I, I just, my attention has been diverted by noticing that in the CV that he produced for today, one of the cases that Shirek has listed is one called Great Elephant Against Trafigura, the crude sky, 
about which I remember very little, except that he and Simon and I were all involved in it. That's right. Probably That's some right. other places as well. What happened, I really can't recall. But but I but I you but won. I do well, I do <laughs> but I do I recall well. typically <laughs> it was it was a case that was conducted with the conviviality and collegiate atmosphere, yeah. which is happily one of the hallmarks of the shipping bar and indeed the shipping solicitors were for most of the time. Um, so um, Shirag is is um, going to talk about some specific authorities, and then we'll be followed by Mr. Rainey Casey. Um, so Simon, as as you know, is one of the, the brightest stars at the bar. It's official, uh, and <laughs> continues to illumine uh, these chambers, uh, and will no, no doubt go from strength to strength as he always has done. Uh, and um, uh, again, I forbear from giving you too much detail of all of the glamorous successes that are recounted in the CV that I have in front of you, because I happen to know he's going to be talking about one of them himself. <laughs> so I shall leave that to him and now hand over to Helena. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so I thought I would start with uh, basically a sort of brief introduction to the insurance and commercial background uh, in, in which LOIs function. And I know that for a lot of you who are here today, this will be familiar, but I thought the likelihood is there might be a few newcomers to the industry who aren't so um, familiar with LOIs and don't perhaps have so much understanding of the role that they play in, in our work. <clears throat> so then we're going to, I thought we'd look at some common scenarios, most obviously um, the international group letters of indemnity, but also a few other scenarios that are commonplace and where you might want to have an LOI um, to, to give you comfort. Um, and then we're going to think very briefly about how LOIs are drafted uh, before we then hand on to Shirag to, um, and Simon to discuss their recent cases on some very specific issues. So just to hope my animation will work on this, just as, a, as I say, as a refresher or as an introduction for those people who are less familiar with the way it works. Uh, the ship owner issues the bill of, bill of lading, which obviously passes down the banking chain until it reaches the receiver at the discharge port, who, if everything goes well, he trots along to the ship with his original bill of lading and he can go and get his cargo. And of course, the beauty of this system is from the, the ship owner's point of view, as long as he has the original document, he can hand over the goods, he can effect delivery to the hold of the original bill of lading, and he doesn't have to worry about checking the identity or making sure that he's giving the cargo to the right people, because he can be confident that he is. Um, <clears throat> the bill of lading, obviously, in uh, a p &I world, um, is very important in terms of cargo claims. Whilst cargo claims do sometimes arise under the charter party, I think it's fair to say in practice that is relatively rare, and the vast majority of cargo claims will, will arise under a bill of lading. So that's your critical document when you're considering how p &I cover for cargo claims works. So looking at the bill of lading in a little bit more detail, what are the important characteristics from an insurer's point of view? I mean, the, the bill of lading obviously is a multifunctional document. It has lots and lots of terms in it, even more if you're talking about house bills of lading. Uh, but just to focus on the key characteristics from an underwriter's point of view, the, the, it defines the terms of carriage, and it is a cornerstone of p &I cover that the terms of carriage must be no less favourable than the Hague or Hague fiscal rules. So you will generally find either an express clause, or uh, you know, sort of referring to the, the, the relevant regime, or a clause paramount in a bill of lading to make sure that those requirements are met. <clears throat> in addition, uh, it also defines the contractual voyage, so the low port and the dis discharge port. It also has an evidential role, excuse me, because as I mentioned, it, uh, it means that the, um, the ship owner is, can deliver against it because he can be confident that the upholder of the original bill of lading is entitled to the possession of cargo. And finally, it, it evidences the quantity and the condition of goods on receipt. So if you've issued a clean bill of lading and the goods are outturned in a damaged condition, then it, there is an assumption that that damage has occurred during the voyage and then it's subject to the Hague as rules um, and defences. So moving on to the specific scenarios which come up more often than others, the international group of LOIs uh, address three specific scenarios, so we'll be looking at when you use them. It's worth mentioning that my understanding is they are currently under review and there may be people in the room who can give a little bit more detail about that than I can. 
Um, so watch this space, it's probably unlikely to be a radical change, but I do think there are going to be some revisions in the pipeline. So the first uh, scenario is delivery without the blading. And the commercial context in which this happens is obviously the bill of blading will be passing through the banking chain and the ship might arrive at the discharge port before the bill of lading gets there. And in that situation, the charter will issue a letter of indemnity asking the ship owner to deliver to the final receiver in this graphic, uh, party D, <coughs> rather than delivering against the original bills of lading. And in an ideal world, you hope that the bill of lading carries on its journey through the banking chain and will eventually reach party D, who then surrenders the bills of lading to the ship owner. And that means that the LOI is no longer effective. It's null and void because the bills of lading are, are spent. So the risk that you have here uh, is that what you're doing is offends p &I cover. One of the first questions that you might want to ask if, if you're trying to be critical or, or challenge the situation is where is the bill of lading? And as I've explained, you know, the most common scenario is that it's stuck somewhere in a bank somewhere far away and it can't you just can't get hold of it but of course there is the possibility that it's been lost and i've certainly seen that scenario i'm sure some of you have as well uh, a few times and that introduces a greater risk because there's always the possibility that somebody might have actually deliberately stolen the bill and they could rock up at the, the discharge port and then you've got people competing both wanting cargo um how do you know that you're delivering to the right person if you don't have an original bill of lading at the discharge board? And um, I think, again, there's somebody probably who can talk about this a bit more than I can uh, in detail, but um, I think practically you would need to get, you know, for example, a copy of the, the, the receivers, the person representing the receiver, their passport, a letter of authority, perhaps from the company, so that if anybody says, well, who did you deliver it to? you can actually produce the evidence and say, yes, I delivered it to the person in, in the, uh, who's named in the letter of indemnity. And then when are the bills accomplished? And this is the main risk that whilst you've delivered against an LOI and the bills of lading still out there, whoever does have the bill of lading, which as we all know could, and the option is actually a bank, um, they, they might turn up with the bills of lading asking for their cargo that you've already given to somebody else. The second scenario, which the IG have dealt with, is delivery at a different destination. And again, the sort of commercial context where you might see this could be uh, a, a ship that's being loaded with cargo, where it's being sold on in transit, and perhaps instead of delivering to car um, the receiver C, you're then in one geographic jurisdiction, you're then delivering to a different place altogether. So there is a genuine commercial context in which this arises. Um, and also, you know, if you had a cargo owner who's a charter as well, they might have their own commercial reasons. So these are all quite genuine reasons why people might be wanting to change things from, from you know, the details of the bill of lading or perform a different contract is probably a better way to put it uh, than originally anticipated. The problem here, um, sorry, so just the, uh, the problem here is that it also offends the and I have a common theme on this one. Hmm. Um, so first, and it does it on a number of different levels. First of all, you have a deliberate act, which will prejudice your, your p and cover, but also at law, the carrier loses the protection of the Hague Bisbee rules and is, is reduced to a common carrier. And if you might remember earlier on, I mentioned that it was a cornerstone of the p and I club cover to have carriage on uh, hey, Bisbee rules or better. So if you if you're carrying on terms that are less favourable than Hey, Bisbee rules, you're out of cover. So you've lost your cover twice over in this scenario. So what is the solution? Well, the solution the industry has come up with is the LOI uh, and letters of indemnity provide comfort to the owners when they're being asked to prejudice their P and I cover club cover by a deliberate act. And so in a way, they function as what I call quasi insurance. And I think that's quite an important thing to have in mind. Because nowadays, um, all of the clubs, you know, are financially rated. And so, you know, when you enter your ship with a, with a club, you know exactly what you're getting in terms of financial strength. And when you're taking an LOI from a contractual counterparty, I'm not sure that so many of them are rated in quite the same way. And although there is provision for an LOI to be uh, endorsed by a, a, a bank, a signed by a bank, the only situations I've ever actually seen that happening 
is where a bill of lading has been lost and the bank wants to keep the cargo moving so they can get paid. Um, and this obviously is a subject that Chirag will talk in about in a bit more detail in due course. So LOIs are now so commonplace that they are actually often written into charter parties. And one of my colleagues at Guard was telling me about a case that he dealt with uh, where the master had said that during his seafaring career, he had never actually seen an original bill of lading, which tells you how commonplace this is. So the club stepped in and this is a, a point of contention, I think, for some people. I've certainly had members in the past who have said, what on earth has this got to do with the, the international group of P&I clubs? If you're out of cover, then they've got no interest in the consequences of the act that you're doing. But I think it really goes back to the club's roots, where, you know, as a mutual, you want to try and help your members. So they came up with these standard forms of LOIs that are easy for people to just adopt and use. And they cover three scenarios. As I mentioned, they covered scenario without, uh, in the absence mm. of an original bill of lading. They cover uh, delivery at a non-contractual port. And then for the sake of completeness, they cover a combination of the two. So you've got delivery without a, a bill of lading um, and at a different port. When else might you need an LOI? The international club LOIs are clearly not exhaustive. Um, they, I think all it falls into two categories, which I would say would all term as non-contractual performance and um, where there's a material alteration of risk. What do I mean by non-contractual performance? Well, there's two scenarios that breaks down into two different sort of categories. First of all, if you're asked to do something under the charter party, which would result in a breach of the bill of lading contract. Um, so for example, uh, slow steaming, that it might be fine under the terms of the charter party. Your charter gets to uh, economize on his bunkers when the bunker prices are high, uh, but that's a, a breach of the bill of lading contract in terms of not prosecuting the voyage without most dispatch. Um, nowadays, I think as these scenarios have become more common, you know, BIMCO have got involved drafted contract uh, clauses for different scenarios that contain indemnities in them, so you don't need to set LOIs perhaps so much. The other scenario is if you're asked to do something beyond. The, the performance of the charter party. And it's a logical consequence that if you're performing an existing contractual obligation, then it can't be valid consideration. And why indeed should you be indemnified for something which you've already agreed to do? Um, material alteration of risk, I put in a different category because it's a more general point about uh, an insurance requirement that you act as a prudent uninsured. <clears throat> And I think when, I mean, you know, people try and legislate within charter parties for as much as they can, but the reality is that you can't foresee what's going to be coming up in the future and there's always unexpected eventualities. Um, and so there is a general expectation that people will act reasonably, which we know generates a lot of debate and, and litigation as to what is, is reasonable. Um, and so for to give an example, uh, if you had a, a common scenario would be an LOI for discharging a moisture sensitive cargo in rain. I mean, that's not a very sensible thing to do. So if you are asked to do it, you want to get an LOI to cover you for the consequences. Um, I put on this slide that you should have a clear allocation of risk to the LOI issuer. If they're asking you to do something, they should bear the consequences of your compliance. But of course, that depends on which side of the fence you're sitting on. If you were issuing the LOI, I'd probably be saying the, the opposite. Um, and, and also, I think it's worthwhile considering, is there an ordinary level of risk associated with the activity? And to give you an example of what I had in mind when I put this on there, I had a case recently where there was a shipshore difference, which was 0.8%. And general industry practice is written explicitly in guards guidance to their rules is that any sort of difference up to about 0.5% will be accepted as a general margin of error in terms of draft surveys on which the ship's figures are based. The charter members that I was talking to had been asked and had agreed to issue an LOI for the full 0.8%. And when it came to me, I was saying, well, hold on a second, up 0.5%, you're fine. That was governed by the ICA under the charity party. So you split that 50-50. Why are you picking up the risk for the whole shortage rather than just the little bit more, you know, that's over the accepted margin of error? So that, that's the sort of scenario when I talk about, you know, is there an ordinary level of risk associated with the activity? And then should there be any limits on the transfer of risk? And again, 
I think that depends on which side of the fence that you, you're sitting on. And that's why I pose these as questions rather than suggestions. Other common LOIs, uh, I'll just put this in for the sake of completeness, really the scriptural difference that I mentioned, switching and splitting the bills of lading, commingling, blending, single foul segregation, discharging in rain. The list is endless. I have a colleague at Guard who told me once he has 140 different LOIs in his document folder. So <laughs> there you go. Quite remarkable. Um, in terms of drafting LOIs, and I put a dollar sign on this just to remind us all, financial standing of the LOI issue is very important. I may be repeating that yet one more time. Um, so we can, we're just going to look very quickly at the content, think about some practical considerations, and then touch upon some legal considerations, which obviously uh, Shira and Simon will be talking about in a lot more detail. So the content of an LOI, the structure is broadly the same. Uh, you have a paragraph that will set out the factual background. Then you have what in my mind is the critical paragraph, which is where you define what you're asking the ship owner to do, the your disponent owner. Um, and then you have the operative clauses, uh, which are indemnity, funding any litigation, issuing security, and joint liability for the signatories. And then the one that I think needs potentially to, to be considered a little bit more carefully, which is the law and jurisdiction clause. So practical considerations. Uh, you are what you do, not what you say you'll do. And if you flip that around the other way, normally this is a good thing, but this is potentially a bad thing. If you don't do what you say you're going to do, you need to make sure that you comply with uh, your LOI terms and make sure that you perform. I think one of the issues that might be being looked at in, in the last um, the, the group C form, the international group, is there you have two requirements. You have a, a, a request to detour and will deviate to a different contractual court. And you have a request to deliver in the absence of uh, an original bill of lading. So if something happens on the way to that other court, have you actually, are you going to actually be able to rely on that LOI? Because those two requirements are accumulative, they're not alternative. So I think that is a potential issue that might be being looked at. Extent of additional risk I've already talked about. And also the importance, one of the, the members I used to deal with years ago had a real bugbear about discharge versus delivery, but I think it's a really good point. And again, I think somebody might be talking about the importance of that point a little bit later. Um, allocation of risk, state the trans that it's been transferred explicitly. Should the master have any discretion? It, it Again, it depends on which side of the fence you're sitting on. But from my point of view, as somebody who's trying to mitigate the risk of litigation, I would say, no, just keep everything very black and white, avoid areas of grey. That's not good for most of the people in this room, but that's what I would be telling my members. Um, and then there it is again, counterparty credit risk, very important. Um, you need to make sure that your LOI issuer is capable of performance <coughs> under the LOI. Um, and sorry, how can you evidence performance? Legal considerations. Um, these are really just things for people to think about, I think. Uh, law and jurisdiction, if you don't get that right, then you can be in real trouble because you can't even start your claim. Um, and the IGLOIs provide for English high court jurisdiction. So for a lot of people that will take and adapt that wording, they'll just follow on with that. But I wonder whether it requires a bit more thought and consideration should be given to arbitration. That's partly because the New York Convention is more is, is widespread, so it makes uh, service and enforcement uh, potentially easier. But also just the simple fact that an arbitration award can be converted to an English court judgment, whereas you can't go the other way. So you cover both bases if you can get an arbitration award. Um, and then the other thing, that I, the other issue that I have, which actually I've seen quite recently uh, being covered in an LOI, is do you really want a standalone agreement, which an LOI is? You know, <laughs> it leads to fragmentation of litigation, which is obviously bad for the clubs who are funding it and the members where they're funding it, um, because you've got to pay for two sets of proceedings. And of course, you've got the risk of inconsistent decisions. And as I mentioned quite recently, I've actually seen a, a suite of LOIs where they've been expressed without prejudice to the terms of the charter party and also to any previous LOIs, which I'm not quite so sure about. Um, and then the security provision as well. You know, as an insurer, we can't issue security for a third party's liabilities. We can only issue security for our assured and the half our assured. And so although the, you know, there is this idea that you're going to issue security to the arresting party, it doesn't work like that in practice. And I wonder whether that should be um, sorted out a little bit better. 
And then finally, something that I'm not sure many people really think about is what formal requirements there are, um, you know, memorandum and articles of a company. Does that person have authority to sign off on the LOI? You really don't want to be running into problems if you've actually got to call on that document. And then, as, as Robert mentioned earlier on, you know, is there a potential solution in the form of electronic bills of lading? And, and I have to say this, you know, this has been around for years now and it doesn't seem to have gained traction in the way that you would have thought it would. But it's a very elegant solution, digital endorsement. The bill should always be available for any at any time to be surrendered so that they can be amended and everything would be properly regulated on the bill of lading rather than having LOIs for, for changing the terms. So plus, as Robert alluded to, potentially there could be, one would hope, reduced scope for fraud. And yet, having said that, I had a member who was asked to accept an LOI just the other week for change of destination where e-bills were concerned, to which I said, if you know, you need to tell them if that if they think you're going to prejudice your P&I cover because they can't be bothered to do the admin for an electronic bill of lading, then they need to rethink it. And on that note, I will thank you very much for your attention and pass over to Shirley. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Um, first thing, can you guys see that screen? Yeah, you're fine. Okay. And secondly, I was supposed to say this. Um, there is no hard copy uh, handout, but handouts will be emailed to all the attendees. So with that, I will proceed to talk about um, particular aspects of the enforcement of LOIs, and in particular, with reference to the Gulf Petrochem mitigation that has been uh, heard in the commercial court in the last couple of years. So the heading for my talk is uh, Deadly LOIs, is your LOI worth the paper it's written on? And this might give some salutary lessons to um, owners who very happily take pieces of paper, which are called LOI, um, that are signed by people which may not be worth powder or shot. So I'll just go through the background and I'll try not to repeat anything that Helen has already said. Um, but as Helen has said, um, common practice, particularly in oil and oil product trades, for delivery to be made against LOIs as opposed to the presentation of bills of lading. However, um, it's absolutely established law, most succinctly set out by Lord Denning in the Privy Council, that it's perfectly clear law that a ship owner who delivers without production of the bill of lading does so at his peril. So that's why we have LOIs. Um, but as we will get into, um, and indeed, as the clubs have pointed out, LOIs are not always enforceable, which means your LOI may not even be worth the paper it's written on. And as we'll see, you're actually undertaking a similar risk of it being worthless, even if it is enforceable, because you're then getting into the um, credit worthiness of the counterpart. Now, as Helen has explained, uh, no p &I cover unless directors exercise their discretion in members' favour. And as we will see, there is a risk not only of delivering to the wrong person, but also when you deliver to the right person. And in most cases, the delivery will be to the right person. It's just that the bank isn't paid thereafter. And the bank says, well, actually, although I wanted you to deliver to X, um, I now assert my rights under the Bill of Lading. Now that raises lots of additional questions, which, one of which was considered in the Siena recently, which I'm not going to go into. Um, I'm going to focus on the enforcement of NOIs. Now, there's a vast array of uh, commercial court decisions that make it clear that LOIs are prima facie enforceable by mandatory injunctions. And the reason for that is damages are an inadequate remedy. As uh, Mr. Justice Cook pointed out um, in the Limathong Glory, the whole purpose of having the requirement, which is one of the four requirements I think Helena listed, in the LOI for the provision of security is so that the owner doesn't get into a position where it has to rely on a damages claim. 
it doesn't want damages. It wants to continue using its vessel. It doesn't want its vessel arrested. It doesn't want its vessel detained. For that reason, as the Justice Cook pointed out in the Lima Kong Glory, that it's generally inequitable not to grant specific performance so as to require provision of security, either to prevent arrest or to procure the release of a vessel that has already been arrested. As a result, there's a very heavy burden on a signatory to an LOI who is seeking to avoid the obligation that he has undertaken. And the first obligation that will be enforced is that for the provision of security to procure the release or non-arrest of the vessel. Now, it's also true to say that LOIs will not be enforceable if they offend public policy. Now, as we've seen, generally they don't offend public policy because it's part of the normal business. So when would they offend public policy? Well, it's when it's manifestly illegal or tortious to the carrier's knowledge. So if to the knowledge of the owner receiving the LOI, the act that is being asked and it's covered by the LOI is manifestly illegal or tortious, then even though, let's say the charterer has asked for that act, has given an LOI, has promised to provide, in, provide an indemnity, the courts won't enforce it. In addition to knowledge, uh, the Brown Jenkinson decision makes it clear that recklessness is sufficient as well. And there is also the decision of Mr. Justice Stoughton in the Sagona, where he talk, gives a slightly different test, where he says, asks whether the situation is such that it was likely to or should have incited the suspicions of the master such that the master should have refused to have delivered or to have carried out the act against which an indemnity is given. Generally, the indemnities are enforced, um, but it is worth bearing in mind um, that provision. And in fact, I have an arbitration at the moment that is dealing precisely with that exception. And uh, we'll see what happens to that. So, I'm now going to apply those principles and talk about a case that I was involved in in the commercial court called the tenacity. And um, the background facts are set out in the first bullet point. So the owners had time chartered their vessels to my client's NOC, which was an oil trader based in uh, Dubai, um, who in turn had void chartered the uh, vessel to Gulf Petrochem, which is a large. UAE company involved in the distribution, manufacture, and refining of oil and oil products. And this was a substantial entity. The gas oil was carried from Kuwait to Humraya in the UAE. And in the usual course of events, the cargo was delivered um, by the 1st of May without production of bills of lading against back-to-back -back LOIs issued by NOC to owners and by Gulf petrochemical NOC. So as you can see, the arrows that point that way and the first bullet point point the other way when it comes to the LOIs. And in fact, my client had made sure that it did not issue any LOI to the owners until it had received Gulf Petrochem's LOI. And my client was very comfortable with Gulf Petrochem being a substantial entity um, and was more than happy to give an LOI in its name to the owners. The purchase price of the cargo was $11.5 million and was financed by Natixis Bank, which held the bills of lading. Then there was a number of discrepancies found within the accounting of Gulf Petrochem. Um, it appears there may have been a massive internal fraud and Gulf Petrochem went into some form of administration. It is an administration in itself, a restructuring officer was appointed in July 2020. As a result, Gulf Petrochem did not pay its bank. And the bank therefore came looking for recompense. And since its client wasn't paying for it, 
it was looking towards the owners, the only other person who could. So in early August 2020, Natix has demanded delivery of the cargo or 11.5 million from the owners. The owners quite naturally called on NOCs, that's my client's LOI, and NOC in turn called on Gulf Petrochem's LOI. The LOIs all provided that they would be triggered, uh, they would need to answer if arrest was threatened. So the first question for the court was, did the demand for cargo or money with an express reservation of rights to enforce without further notice to you threaten arrest? The, uh, the judge, his honor, Judge Pelling had no difficulty with that. He said that the language used in the claim letter must be construed in its relevant commercial context and the reservation of rights to enforce was quite clear, the, an implicit reference to arrest if the 11.5 million plus of the security for costs was not provided. Now, my clients were left in a bit of a bind because um, they had been counting in the event that this happened to the extent that even thought that there would ever be, it would ever be claimed on. They were obviously relying on Gulf Petrochem to put them in funds so that they could in turn put the owners in funds by way of security. Now, NOC said they did not have the money. They did not simply did not have the 13 million um, that the uh, owners have demanded. The owners applied for mandatory injunction against NOC. And what we argued was that equity will not act in vain. The court will not make an order that cannot or will not be complied with. Or we also pointed out that because it's an injunction as opposed to an award of damages, um, it is enforced by way of contempt. Um, and even the directors, insofar as they failed to comply, could personally be liable as well. And we relied on two authorities, firstly from the Court of Appeal in the Udal case, which said it is unthinkable that a court should put a man at risk of imprisonment by making an order which it knows at the time of making the order is impossible of performance. And uh, Lord Bingham, in the later case of South Bucks District Council, uh, said that the court should only ever make an order, and we're talking about injunctions here, with which a defendant can and reasonably ought to comply. And we said both of those authorities supported us because we didn't simply have the 13 million that the owners asked for. Now, the first hearing came on before Mr. Justice Foxton. Um, he made it very clear that the burden of proving impossibility by way of being, because of impecuniosity rests on the defendant alleging. Uh, he said that the fullest detail possible of efforts, that effort, the efforts that have been made to provide such security as can be provided should be adduced. And he made it very clear that it's important that both my clients and Gulf Petrochem appreciate that given the commercial importance of promises to provide security of this kind, the commercial court will want to be very confident that the protestations about any inability to comply or the extent of any inability to comply appear very clearly from the evidence. Now at that hearing, NOC, my client said that they were they were able to pay 250,000 towards the security and did do so, they were nevertheless subject to a mandatory injunction to provide the full 13 million, but given permission to apply to set that aside. The application to set aside came on before his honor Judge Pelling sitting as a high court judge. And in support of that, NOC has produced an expert accounting report from Grant Thornton. The judge ultimately and it must be said with extreme reluctance, um, discharge the mandatory injunction. If you read the judgment, you will see that what in fact happened, and I'm not revealing anything that isn't out there in public, is that shortly after, very shortly after the LOI was called on, um, large uh, payments were made by the company to its sole shareholder and director. Um, under the guise of various 
um, reasons. And that left the company itself without any money, but with the director having um, taken, taken that money. Now, as you can see, that was not a very attractive case for me to make, but in the end, the judge was persuaded that the company itself, regardless of what relief there was, what was possible against the sole shareholder and director, the company itself was now unable to pay. And there was no prospect of either the sole director or anybody else connected with the company putting in money to help NOC to put up the security. You know, the reason for that is no reasonable person would just shovel in up to 13 million into the company, which would immediately go out of the door to provide security to the owners. I mean, you, you're just throwing very good money after bad. So the result was that the owners were left with only 250,000 in security from their time charters NOC in the face of an 11.5 million claim plus one and a half million for security. So that is the only case I know of where the, an English court hasn't automatically enforced an LOI by way of a mandatory injunction. The same defense was tried, has been tried twice. Um, firstly, it was tried in the same case by Gulf Petrochem as against us. And it failed in that sense because Gulf Petrochem's accounts were opaque and his honor Judge Pelling was not satisfied with the evidence given by the restructuring officer. Um, <clears throat> It still didn't mean that they've paid us, but the injunction was granted. It was also tried before Mr. Justice Butcher in the SDI Orchard case the following year. And there he found that he, the defense wasn't made, made out because there was a lack of full and frank financial disclosure. They hadn't disclosed the identity of the management or the beneficial owner or related companies and no evidence of their recent financial activity. So if you want to make out this defense, you basically have to open your books completely and show that there is no prospect, no reasonable prospect of you getting money from anywhere and that you actually do not have the money. Um, just to get to the end of the Gulf Petrochem story, uh, my clients and three other claimants applied for the mandatory injunction that I mentioned and the mandatory injunction was provided and the impecuniosity defense failed uh, when GP raised it. Um, the Gulf Petrochem nevertheless has not provided the security and there was a summary judgment application and all four parties got summary judgment. Um, again, as Helena said, one of the main defenses, actually the main defense against the enforcement, uh, in addition to impecuniosity, so, and in, so in relation to the summary judgment, was that the person who signed the LOIs was not authorized. Even though he had signed numerous ones before, he was the same person who signed all four of these LOIs. And so we had to go through the rigmarole of getting UAE law evidence, and of course, making arguments under English law regarding ostensible authority and so forth. So what are the takeaways? I hope I'm in time. Um, owners delivering without receiving bills of lading do so at the peril. Most LOIs are legally enforceable, but they're <clears> only as good as the credit worthiness of your counterparty. There's a risk of not only delivering to the wrong person, but even when you deliver to the right person. Mandatory injunction is a powerful remedy, you can't get left on the stone. And if you do want to use that defense, full disclosure and compelling evidence is going to be insisted on. It's not going to be easy. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to talk about a, a, a case recently decided by the Court of Appeal, which deals with the applicability or inapplicability of the Hague or Hague Bisbee rules time limit to misdelivery where it occurs after discharge. And as Helena said, there is a, an issue about di discharge and delivery. 
and I want to start by setting a little bit the context for which, uh, in which the Court of Appeal decision was made. This picture illustrates the over the rail concept of discharge. Technically, discharge uh, it takes place where the goods pass the rail, although it may, it may now continue until it lands upon the quay. But discharge is an entirely separate legal concept from delivery. And here is a little bit more context for the battle which took place in the Court of Appeal. Leaving aside certain types of cargo, we can think of examples, liquid bulk cargo, oil cargoes. Most cargoes now are not delivered at the point of discharge, either when they cross the ship's rail or when they land in the quayside. There's always going to be some type of storage or time taken before the goods are collected by the person entitled to them. As long ago as 1981, Lord Wilberforce and the New York Star said that the practice that consignees rarely take delivery of goods at the ship's rail, but will normally collect them after some period of storage on or near the wharf was almost a commonplace. So when we look at the Hague rules and the hague Bisbee rules, we've got two different concepts to have in mind. Discharge, the act of getting goods off the ship, and delivery, which is the culmination of the complete performance of the bill of lading contract, which is the delivery of the goods by the carrier to the person entitled to receive them, normally the bill of lading holder, if the bill of lading is ever presentable. And that poses a difficulty in the context of the rules, because as we know, uh, or we uh, uh, familiar with, Article 2 of both sets of rules says that under every contract for carriage of goods by sea, the carrier enjoys the responsibilities and liabilities here and after set forth, and then a sequence of events, or what is arguably a sequence of events, in relation to the loading, handling, stowage, carriage, custody, care, and discharge of such goods. What's commonly referred to as the Hague, or Hague is being open quotes, period of responsibility. But then one has to marry that up with the time bar. And the time bar that will depend upon what set of rules you've got in your bill of lading. At the Hague rules, and I've highlighted two different aspects in each uh, wording, the black wording is the same uh, in both sets of rules and refers not to discharge, but from the one year running from delivery of the goods or the date when the goods should have been delivered. And when one looks at Article 3 and Rule 6 more widely, there are some very antiquated provisions that no one ever takes any account of, which deal with the position after discharge and before delivery for inspection by the receiver, tallying, matters of that kind. So there is a contemplation there of a different stage and the final stage of the performance of the bit of lady contract. The time bar wording in terms of what it operates to discharge liability for under the Hague rules was always regarded as very wide. All liability in respect of loss or damage, and it's been given in the cases of the Hague rules, a very wide construction. But we'll come on to this and we'll see why it got wider. In the Hague Visby rules, the words are much, much better. Shall in any event be discharged from all liability whatsoever in respect of the goods. And it's probably a good idea to keep those words, if you can, I'm not waiting for the drinks outside, as I'm tailing Charlie in your <laughs> mind when we put the rest of the slides. The first case to try to grapple a little bit with misdelivery and the operation of the Hague rules time was the Alhani. Here she is in the glory on the left. There she is doing a ship to ship transfer. So, this was a case where uh, it was a Hague rules case, it's important to remember. But because it was an oil cargo, uh, discharge uh, took place at the same time as delivery, and delivery took place at the same time as discharge, namely at the connecting flange between the Alhani and the vessel receiving uh, the oil. Uh, David Foxen, we've already had a photograph of David Foxen, so I haven't given anyone here of him. Held that the words in any event in all liability in Article 3, Rule 6 of the Hague Rules really, were very, very wide and would cover all liability in this delivery. And he stressed an important point the object of Article 3, Rule 6 was to now uh, enable the ship owner clearly and unequivocally to close his books within a reasonable time after the voyage. Therefore, the court rejected the argument, which was run by Stephen Kenny, that the, the uh, Article 3, Rule 6 time bar only applies for claims for breach of the rules themselves. No, it doesn't. It applies to all liability. But what unfortunately was tantalizing was that it wasn't necessary in the Alhani 
for the judge to consider whether the Hague rule was time bar applied to Mr. Libby occurring after discharge, because Mr. Libby didn't occur after discharge, it occurred on discharge. And he made it quite plain that he wasn't going to say anything about that. That nevertheless uh, gave rise to a lot of um, commentary and uh, uh, considering by the commentators as to what would be the position after uh, if Mr. Libby occurred after discharge. And the Court of Appeal, in the decision I'll come on to, uh, summarized the position as being there was a slight consensus that under the Hague Bisbee rules, at least, it should. But the position was left entirely open. So the case I was involved in uh, um, successfully, although I have to pay tribute to my opponent who's sitting hiding behind somebody there, who was admirably argued by Christopher Smith Casey in the Court of Appeal, stepping into Stephen Berry. Uh, um, this was the case of the giant ace. There she is in all her glory. And really, in one sense, the facts are pretty banal because they're commonplace wherever discharge and delivery are not contemporaneous. Cargo of coal was sold by traffic over to Farlin. They then were sold to various sub buyers. Farlin, uh, in buying the goods, had its purchase financed by the bank, in bank, who took a pledge of the bills of lading, that was their security. Cargo was discharged into a port control stockpile and was subsequently given without production of bills of lading against an NOI to, to open quotes for receivers. The bank wasn't paid and claimed damages from this delivery against my clients, the carrier. Interestingly, although the bank subsequently said there is no one year time bar, it's six years, and they tried desperately to bring suit effectively within the one year, but they failed. And the previous decisions of the commercial court, decisions of Mr. Justice you know, Cockerell on that. So the argument was, that the Hague rules or the Hague Bisbee rules time well, did not apply. What were the competing arguments? And these are effectively the same arguments that went up to the uh, Court of Appeal, with one exception. We argued that the Hague Bisbee rules applied and that the much widened wording, uh, 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 wider wording of Article 3, Rule 6 meant it covered not only Mr. Libby on discharge, but also Mr. Libby after discharge. If we were wrong about that and the Hague rules applied, we said that was also the position and the wide wording of the Hague rules, even though it hadn't been necessary for David Foxman to decide it. As a um, third string to our bow, we argued that if Article 3 Rule 6 didn't apply at all, to construct the rules, there was an implied term of the contract and carriage that had been evading unless excluded, that the rules would automatically apply after discharge. And we relied upon what was called the carver on bills of lading implied term, and a comment by Lord Justice Longmore in the MSC Amsterdam, who said, we thought rather encouragingly, and we'll see it didn't really work, that no doubt if no agreement is made for the period after discharge, it might be easy to say that the parties have impliedly agreed that the obligations and immunities contained in the rules continue after actual discharge until the goods are taken into the custody of the receiver. That's the view expressed by Professor Triton and Professor Reynolds in Carbon Bills Lady. The bank's arguments were that these, the Hague rules, not the Hague, these really rules applied, so the narrow wording was the one to look at, but whichever set of rules applied, which brings us back to the discharge stroke delivery, the Article 3, Rule 6 time bar, while applying to any breaches under the rules, only applies to acts occurring between loading and discharge. There may be a grey area about what actually is the start of loading, there may be a grey area about what actually the finishing of loading, but that was their all defining period of responsibility under both sets of rules, so it didn't matter. Article 3, Rule 6 only covered liabilities occurring between those two points. And then they had a third string to their bow that even if Article 3, Rule 6 did apply, they relied upon clause 2 of the Congen Bill form, and I'll come on to that argument if I've got time at the end. The LMA, it went to an LMA arbitration. Here's your starter question for 10. Who are these arbitrators? Shall I ask members of the audience? No, I won't. <laughs> it was a very distinguished LMA tribunal uh, uh, from left to right. Uh, Tim Young KC, uh, uh, in the centre, Julia Dias KC, now Mr. Justice Dias, and on the far right, Sir Bernard Eder. And they decided that the uh, position, you know, rather more holistic analysis, both of the Hagen and Hague Bisbee rules, was that the Article 3 Rule 6 time bar applied. Uh, and also, there was, there was an implied term. If that was wrong, in, in the sense that it was outlined by Carver and in the MSC Amsterdam. Uh, the bank appealed and, and got permission to appeal from Mr. Justice Butcher, and the matter came to the commercial court and came on before uh, Sir William Blair, who was a photograph of him, 
um, and he broadly followed the arbitrator's reasoning and held that the claim was time barred. The only thing that now changed at this stage was the arbitrators had found on, on the true construction and effect of the terms paramount in the bill that the Hague Bisbee rules apply, not the Hague rules. By the time it got to the commercial court, we were only talking about the Hague Bisbee rules because the judge giving permission to appeal, Mr. Justice Butcher, did not give permission on the clause paramount. So now we were really only talking about the Hague Bisbee rules. The matter then came to the Court of Appeal. And again, there's a quiz I'm looking to see if you ever make a blank about that. <laughs> Sean, which I got to identify who these people are. <laughs> so we've got Lord Justice Popperwell, Lord Justice Males presiding, and Lord Justice Nuji. Uh, after the two days uh, we had, I think Chris would agree, a pretty hot tribunal. Um, and uh, the decision of the Court of Appeal uh, was in fact in a number of stages. In relation to the time bar point, the way in which the Court of Appeal approached it was first of all to consider the position under the Hague rules, under the unamended the text of Article 3 or 6. Then when they'd done that, they go on to consider the position under the amended Article 3, Rule 6 was very different language than the Hague Bisbee rules, and to consider why that text was changed. So, it, it, looking at the Hague Rules, which so now what had happened before the arbitrators was effectively being cut back by the Court of Appeal. In terms of the scope of Article 3, Rule 6 of the Hague Rules, the Court of Appeal essentially said three things. One, the Hague Rules themselves only apply generally between loading and discharge, Article 2. Two, despite the very wide wording of Article 3, Rule 6, there are, I would suggest, respectable arguments that the time bar was meant to be a general time bar, running from, from delivering or discharge to close the books. But despite the wide language of Article 3, Rule 6, on balance, the better view, those are the words of the Court of Appeal, on balance, the better view is that it did not apply to, to Mr. Libby occurring after this charge. And it was put rather graphically by Lord Justice Mayles. Article 3, Rule 6 is part of the rules to which the contract was made subject by Article 2. Logically, its application cannot extend beyond the scope of the rules themselves, as defined by Articles 1 and 2. In the original rule, at any rate, Article 3, Rule 6 is not a cuckoo in the Hague Rules Nest. Uh, and usefully, uh, people were arguing that yeah, Al Hani's only decision of David Fox at QC at first instance, the Court of Appeal uh, endorsed specifically his decision about the scope of the Hague Rules time bar or misdelivery occurring simultaneously with discharge. So that was the Hague Rules. What about the Hague Bisbee Rules? Coming on to the Hague Bisbee Rules, the Court took two approaches. One, it looked at the language of Article 3, Rule 6 in its new form and tried to work out what it meant. Secondly, it took a, a, a treaty interpretation approach, which we all meant to do, but often doesn't happen quite as impeccably as it was done by the Court of Appeal, by looking at the principles under the Vienna Convention on the Interpretation of the Treaties 1969 and having a look at the travel and preparatoire. On the linguistic approach, the Court said that the new wording in the uh, Hague Bisbee Rules version of Article 3, Rule 6, especially the word whatsoever coupled with all liability, uh, was very significant. And the court was, in, I mean, right to say, that unless the new rule applies in cases where the original rule did not, the amendment would achieve nothing, and that was not a very sensible conclusion. And therefore, the court said that it was a reasonable inference that the new rule was intended to apply even in cases outside the sphere of application of the rules and looking at the comparison between the original and the amended versions of Article 3 and Rule 6. So far, so good. But the Court of Appeal then went a further stage uh, to look at matters uh, having regard to the travel of the and to take a, what I call a Vienna Convention approach. There aren't many pictures on, on um, Google road signs to Vienna when I found this one. <laughs> the, the, the stop falsch signs that stop you turning into the wrong wrong lane, I think. Mm -hmm. Quite graphic. Um, now, the use of Hague's rule in tra travel, or Hague rule travel over that matter, is governed by Article 32 of the Vienna Convention. And that allows you to look at the travel for two reasons. One, 
to confirm the meaning which you've already arrived at by looking at the text, or to to resolve any ambiguity in the text. And of course, we'll be able to it in that sense if there were any ambiguity. But it's very, very difficult to get a result out of that after Hay Williams or Hay Wisby or Trevor Roberts has been there to try to argue it. I try to argue it for other people who have tried to argue it for. And indeed, I was asking in the Donald Domain lecture in 2020, which no one saw because of COVID, but, but was, was published in Lloyd's Maritime Commercial Commercial and Quarterly, which tracks all the sunken ships in, in, where people try to argue that Hay Williams travel and they get nowhere. Why do they get nowhere? Because of the test which English law applies of the need for a bullseye, and that's what we're staying for, only possible when the court is satisfied that Travo clearly and indisputably point to definite legal intention. Uh, only a bullseye counts, nothing less will do. So here is a picture of a, a maritime advocate trying to score a bullseye with the Travo preparatoire. I, I can tell you that the 2.37 meters often feels like being a lot longer than that. But in this case, the position was different because unlike the usual position of the Hague, Hague rules travel, where you're fishing around in lots and lots of debates, the Hague Disby rule travel are unusual. One, they identified specifically on an agenda, see my conference stock in 1963, what points needed to be addressed and why. Secondly, with Article 3, 1 and 6, the point was specifically taken to address delivery of the goods to a person not entitled to receive delivery of them. Three, the actual discussions are very focused and focus on that particular point and why the wide wording was taken. So for that reason, uh, uh, you can look at this in your slides when you get them home, when you download them, the Court of Appeal was absolutely clear that the object of the amendment was to give the text a, a very wide meaning so as to cover the, cases where even the claims were grounded in the delivery of goods to a person not entitled to, even in the case of what we call a wrong delivery. A wrong delivery. And so the Lord Justice Mayor said that was the necessary bullseye. And uh, the argument against, which was that they were only planning to deal with misdelivery occurring at this charge, uh, uh, was rejected because, uh, as the court said, it's unlikely in the extreme that they intended the time limit to apply to misdelivery occurring during the voyage or simultaneously with discharge. But not the typical case of this delivery occurring after discharge. How many times does delivery take place simultaneously with discharge? And was that were people really only thinking of that in 1967-68? So there is a picture which I don't think I'll ever be able to put up again in any talk I ever give on the Hague rules. Okay, bullseye, I warned him about it, but he didn't stand by thunder by saying there's going to be a cheesy photograph of a bullseye. Uh, I won't get that because time is late and we're all gasping for drink. I won't do, say anything about clause 2C of the Congen bill. There is a, 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 the horns of a dilemma. Effectively, uh, the argument was clause 2C is a complete code, therefore the Hagel's, Hagel's rules time is a problem. Uh, they wanted also to argue that Article 2C, which says you can't be no liability for anything at all after discharge, they wanted to say, ah, yeah, but that doesn't apply to misdeliveries. And so uh, uh, their feet were held to the fire during an argument in the court of appeal. And the court of appeal said it either excludes mis a, a, a misdelivery completely, or if it doesn't, you need the Hague rules time bar. Hague rules time bar. What about the Carver implied term? It wasn't necessary for the court of appeal to express a view about that, but that I think is what's happening to the Carver implied term. Being bid a dignified farewell, the court of appeal uh, uh, found considerable doubt, even though they didn't decide it, as to whether it was possible to apply, apply it either as a matter of fact or certainly not as a matter of law. As they, as they put it, seems to me difficult to apply a term that the rules should apply if on their own terms they do not. And so my last two slides, uh, what of the future and the way ahead, I'm going to be very, very cagey here because Christmas uh, McCasey is sitting over there. But these are some open questions which I table for possible uh, uh, discussion over drinks. One, does the decision in the giant ace extend the Hague's rules further in Article 306 to the post-discharge pre-legal period? No, I think the court has been pretty explicit about that. Does it apply Article 306 of the Hague Bismarck rules to anything beyond Mr. Libby claims? Interesting question. Where now for package limitation? In Article 406, or Article 405 of the Hague rules, and particularly the Hague Bismarck rules, where the language is very strong, but where the Travo did not suggest that anybody was thinking 
about uh, uh, the misdelivery problem or the post discharge aspects when they were talking about Article 4 and 5 and amending the package limitation. And fourth and last, where do we go for standard form bills of lading and current paramounts when we see a, a change in favour of Hague's rules, current Hague rules, or the England Battle still continue just as it is? And we looked at the, the Congen bill and previous iterations of it. I think nothing will ever change. So that's that. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me. And uh, if you ask me for a drink, I am. Well, <laughs> Despite those very broad hints from Simon, you may be gasping for drinks, but you're not getting them yet. <laughs> <laughs> because just, although he, he sensibly suggested that drinks would be better if lubricated by alcohol, um, there are a couple of questions that have come in from people not attending, but I need able to hear the answers if we deal with them now. And I'm afraid they're both from you, Simon. Oh. So the, the first one from um, one of the three eminent arbitrators. Oh, no. <laughs> and it's, it's the one who's... who's uh, recently joined the bench as opposed to the one who departed from the bench. I'm sure there's right. a protocol against this. <laughs> um, uh, I have never quite understood why the concept of care and custody does not extend to include post-discharge care and custody. The Hague rules apply to bills of lading which relate to the carriage of goods. Carriage of goods is defined as covering the period um, from loading to discharge, but the bill of lading can, quote, relate to carriage of goods without being confined to that period. So why don't the Hague rules apply to the entire uh, building contract? Well, that's a, very, uh, that's a very good point. I mean, uh, uh, I argue that it should apply to the whole of the contract before the arbitrators. Uh, uh, and I think I can guess uh, uh, where, where that question is coming from. Uh, and the, the, the way the arbitrators looked, I said they took a much more holistic view. They said, hold on a minute. The Hague rules are being put into a, a bill of lading contract to carry on. The bill of lading contract care does not come to an end of the discharge. It specifically includes delivery. Article 3, Rule 6 refers to delivery. There's a case, the OT Sonia, which applies the Hegel's, Hegel's bill, I can't which, to, to matters occurring before loading. And so it, it is artificial to say, no, you've got this little bit before loading and this bit after discharge, which is not covered by the same obligation of care and custody which applies between the, the ship's rail on one side and the ship's rail on the other. And, and I think there's a lot a lot to be said for the, for the arbitrator's uh, approach. And the Court of Appeal didn't really grapple with it in the same way in which the arbitrators dealt with at one point, which was taken by the arbitrators, which is reflected in Sir William Blair's judgment, so I, I can easily discuss it, was the arbitrators said, well, the, the application of the Hague rules by the clause paramount in the bill Come as I said, but, but it, it was in terms of the Hague rules by the into the charter part because the Hague when it, it rules will apply to this bill of lading. And the arbitrators found that significant. It wasn't just applying it to this little bit of the bill of lading, but to the whole of the bill. Very good. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to suggest that um, the, the person who wanted that question asked you should also apply to Christopher Smith, <laughs> who would give a different response. I <laughs> I think you say, I think Stephen Berry said yeah, heterodox. I think, well, I think he did say heterodox, <laughs> but I think very on good. the foundation that that Hague rules originally were a compromise between different commercial yeah. interests, mm -hmm. and was only a willingness for that compromise to extend to a very limited extent, which the Hague rules made clear did not go beyond this one. Very good. We'll see whether that satisfies. And the then question. one, then one more question, which you'll be able to deal with um, much more swiftly: Is the giant ace going to? It says House of Lords, but it must mean Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, permission to appeal. The answer is who knows. Well, permission to appeal is refused by the Court of Appeal. Well, uh, same uh, as it ever and was. Christopher. There we are, <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. You didn't hear it first. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. But those are all the questions that I have. I don't know if anybody wants to raise a question from the floor or whether they feel a quick gargle would be another first. Right, you've all hesitated too long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention and please raise your hands so we can join them together.